Right, let's get started. Uh, so good morning. Uh, welcome to today's coffee session. Um, for those who've joined before, welcome. Uh, for the new joiners, the aim for today is to load you with some key information uh, to progress with this too in your business. It's a short uh, and sharp session, uh, only 30 minutes long, and hopefully before you start the majority of your day. So look, I know uh, governance is not as sexy as AI, but I hope there's something in here for everyone. Uh, on that note, I've seen a mixture of stakeholders in here today. Uh, we have uh, technical, compliance uh, and executive. And I think the reason for that is NIST 2 touches on all levels and all areas of the business. So if any of this content is perhaps slightly out of your remit or your responsibility, don't worry. Um, we've got some practical next steps uh, for you to take away. Also, no need to take notes. We'll send you this presentation afterwards. So let's get stuck in. What is NIST 2? Very simply, uh, NIST 2 is an EU directive. Uh, it will become legislation in all EU member states and it aims for businesses to take a more serious and proactive approach uh, to their IT and cybersecurity. But firstly, let me introduce myself. My name is Bobby Moore. Uh, I'm a business consultant for Kyocera. For those who don't know us, uh, these are the eight key services um, that Kyocera provide in what we call our Hatchie. And I sit here in Kyoto Consulting. The quick elevator pitch about my team, if I may, um, we run assessments in all kinds of industries of all types of businesses, from charities that turn over 1 million to large global corporates that turn over 750 million. Now, our passion is fixing problems. The bigger the problem, the more fun it is for us. And I think our USP is our ability to speak at all levels. For example, strategic, tactical and operational across all key areas of governance, systems and support. We see your responsibilities around IT and technology becoming so vast. And I can tell I'm getting old because I'm starting to say back in my day, you know, it's not just about the cream boxes underneath the desk anymore. And we don't see many providers adjusting to support to all those new levels and different ways of layers like we can. We also have Craig and Liam here today who will draw in later, um, who specialize in our cyber services. Uh, but for now, uh, you're stuck with me, my weatherman silhouette. Um, and we've only got a short time, so let's get stuck in. So I want to do a quick checklist, if I may, to ensure this applies to you. So you're an EU company, you have above 10 million euros in revenue, and you're in the appropriate sector, which we'll touch on in a little bit more detail later. But before you celebrate, because you're not included, even if you're not one of those companies, your suppliers and your customers who do come under this uh, directive are going to start asking you questions about how you adhere to the same standard. And the reason for that is NIST 2 has a, a really large focus on assessing the strength of their supply chain, where they obtain services from and where they share the data to. So I hope, and I think that covers most of us, and you know, the experience I've had around this so far is not enough people know about this. And this came into effect last month, uh, October 2024. So one key element and evolution from NIST 1, the old version of the directive, is the definition of these essential and important entities. So just take a few seconds to have a look and review if you're in scope or whether your partners or your customers are. Um, for those who are in the scope directly as an EU member state, uh, you're going to have to register with the relative, uh, relevant authority, uh, and the timeline is generally to register before the 17th of April next year. However, some entities in some countries, this is going to be as little as the 17th of January 2025. So I want to give a quick quiz um, to showcase you the types of questions that may come up as part of a NIST 2 assessment, so you can initially benchmark where your company is currently at. So question number one, do you know what your organization's third party management controls are, i.e. how do you review your supplies, supplier security standards and how they protect your data? You know, we don't often think about what happens to the data once it leaves our system to the same standard that we do with our systems internally. Does your organization have a centralized risk register and IT and cybersecurity risks? Register? We need to make sure risk isn't a dirty word and that raising risks isn't seen as a criticism within the business. Can you put your hand on an incident report, uh, incident response? Do you know what to do as a business in the event of a cyber security uh, issue or failure? 
And number four, has your leadership team signed off the IT systems recovery time objective, RTO, and recovery point objective, RPO? Now, the RTO um, is how quickly you can restore, and the RPO is how, uh, how long um, can you go back uh, in terms of your backup cycles? And is your executive team involved and aware of the configuration set by IT? Is IT integrate, integrated into your business at that level? So we've talked about what NIST 2 is. Let's talk about what it's not. It's not voluntary. Um, it wouldn't be a consulting slide without some, it depends, it depends. But legally, remember, this is a directive from the EU. So it's up to the member states to kind of adopt this and put this into legislation and law. So just to give you some examples, Hungary and the Netherlands have not implemented NIST 2 into law yet, uh, but Belgium has. And then within each country, you're going to have uh, different regulatory bodies, processes, and maybe some slight differences on scope. So that's hard to see right now because some countries are still adopting the legislation, um, but it's going to be a real fun one to unpick to work out the connecting points between all countries. So to this end, it's not voluntary. And this is something you must do by law if you're an EU member state. It's not exempt for the UK entirely, right? So a, a legal challenge for some uh, from a member state to uh, the UK for NIST 2 is going to be really unlikely um, if you do not have an EU presence in any way, shape or form. For some essential types of services like data center services or social networking businesses, uh, they're going to require you register as an EU entity if you have one. Um, but unless Mr. Zuckerberg is on the call today, uh, more likely um, you're going to be faced from your customers and suppliers through the form of commercial contracts or tender requirements, PQQs. Uh, this is not just an IT issue. So critically, senior management in organisations are held personally accountable. So understandably, this may have grabbed your attention. Uh, and if you've joined the call because uh, of this reason, welcome. Um, or this could be the big stick that you can go and use to wave at people. It's no more, you know, if it has a plug, it's IT, right? And there's a big focus on this two requirements and the board's understanding of cyber threats, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail. So why should cyber and technology be a focus at board level if it's not already? Or more effectively, we like asking the question, what's the cost of doing nothing? On average, £4,000 a minute is the cost that UK companies incur due to a cyber threat. You know, that's the Christmas party down the toilet of nothing else. Now, the sad fact is, uh, as a business, we do more uh, revenue um, with containment than we do with hygiene, i.e. reaction versus proactive. You know, I'm sure our sales director loves that because it's a 10 times quicker return, but it's not great for you as a business. And even outside the NIST 2 regulation, cybersecurity is something more people need to focus on with you know, one third of organisations experiencing these types of issues. And on that note, I've seen and worked with IT managers, CTOs who've been on the other side of a cyber attack. And going through that process, that containment process, I've seen the personal toll it's had on individuals. So it's not too late. Um, you know, the saying I like to use is the best time was to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is today. So please, I implore, do not delay your cyber activities. So you've had all that stress, you've lost business operations, you've suffered business reputational damage, and you've lost business as a result because of this cyber attack. And now you're at risk of being slapped with a fine of 1.7% of your global turnover, just to reiterate, that's global turnover because of a failing to NIST 2 uh, standards. And GDPR fines and NIST 2 are separate legislations. So um, if you've been found to be failing on both, those two are going to stack. So that's 3.7% uh, of global turnover if you're failing to adhere to those, those two directives and two standards. Now, I love this website and I wanted to share with it with you today. It's a global view of threats being detected in real time and the nature and severity of those threats. And I find it quite unnerving to see all these, uh, these threats taking lifetime. Um, but the, worry, the more worrying thing is that the percentage of threats being targeted in, in the UK. Uh, we had a guest speaker in our internal QBR recently, Paddy McGuinness. Uh, and just as I'm not the famous Bobby Moore, he was also not the presenter of Top Gear, but definitely more famous than me. He's been working in uh, the government, uh, at advising the likes of Theresa May and uh, David Cameron. And he spoke about the active digital warfare that the UK experienced more than most of Russia and Iran. 
but let's try and stay out of politics. You know, I think we've got enough of that going on today in America. So what do we do next? This two, SOC two, PCI DSS, DORA, CAF, GDPR. Did you know that there is a NIST two and a NIST two framework? Did you know that NIST two and ISO 27001 are, are really closely aligned? What am I talking about? Well, some of these are regulations that you have to adhere to. Some of them are accreditations or, or certificates you can get as a business, and some are advisory frameworks. And this can all be a bit of a, an alphabet soup and a real nightmare for people to get their heads around, especially if they operate across different countries or if they've got like industry specific regulations that they have to adhere to on top of this as well for people like in the food in industry or, or health. So for most, it's that dragon in the closet, you know, and the, the one that you're wanting to avoid the face. And one big part um, of making this a whole lot easier and manageable for us is that we have a matrix that connects all the standards together. So NIST 2 Article 21.2B matches with ISO 27001 5.1, matches with GDPR Article 32.2, you know. Me and my team are fun at dinner parties, I promise, right? Um, so the second recommendation is to review the standards you have to adhere to and look for that continuity. However, you know, if you don't have a dedicated resource, an internal governance team or some external support, I would say this is probably going to be quite a large undertaking to start from ground zero. However, you know, starting on that journey to look at the frameworks is going to highlight and provide some clarity about some of the gaps you need to fill and give you a gauge on how big or small those those risks are. So. Again, I implore, do look at the frameworks, see which ones apply to you um, and see which optional ones, which may um, help or encompass your business to achieve better standards across IT and cybersecurity. The second benefit of doing this is you're showing cadence, you're showing evidence and you're showing progress. And this is all gonna support you in the future um, for any issues that you may encounter with this two going down the line. So it'd be very easy for me today to prescribe some documents, go and tick a box. Um, but when we work with customers, we only want to see effective governance that actually works and people understand and, and see. And what I'm showing on the screen is a massive oversimplification of what we call a governance framework. And there's lots more layers behind each uh, tier of this, this framework. So bear with me on this one, right? Because I need to zoom out a little bit because uh, NIST 2 is a business-wide change. It's systemic. and when we talk about business uh, change, there's a few things that need to be in place and that's strategy, that's culture, that's policy, that's operations. And this is what a governance framework really is. It's a, it creates a golden thread throughout the business that links all these things together. So if I could just quickly tell you a quick story. Um, I'm one of those annoying lycra cyclists that clog, clog the roads all the time. And uh, I met with someone from the cycling club the other day who uh, used to work for BP. And we got talking about the deep water horizon uh, failure in 2010. And for those who are not aware, it's an oil rig failure that caused 170 million gallons of oil being poured into the oceans off the Gulf of Mexico. So there was a collection of issues. Uh, they had poor failover systems, poor checks. But one that really struck me was uh, one of the emergency cutoff buttons was not pressed for seven minutes, despite the, the pressure gauges and the meters deeming it so. And this is, could have had a massive reduction in the impact. And the reason, do you want to know the reason why the delay of pressing the cutoff button? Is they were waiting for management approval. Uh, and 11 people died uh, during that incident. So that's crazy. So obviously that speaks to process, that speaks to culture, that speaks to responsibility. And that this framework is that in part. But it's also about data getting information and metrics across different layers of your business, KPIs and policies. The impact of an organization that doesn't have a strong governance framework is a business that doesn't have clear processes. They don't support or foster risks being reported from the front line. They've got key man dependencies. They've disjointed or conflicting initiatives, and they've got a disconnected workforce because they lack the clarity of the objections and the direction of the business. If you recognize some of that, you might have a weak governance framework. Now, the bigger the organization, the larger the requirement is to get this right, because the businesses that we do see get this right are more uh, agile, irrespective of, of their size. So the key message here, and the only reason why I wanted to show you, 
is if you don't have the right strategy, the right culture, the, the correct priority around cybersecurity, you are. And sometimes this type of framework is needed to connect the business across all levels. Uh, and as this is a business wide change, as we've said, um, you need to make sure you get those different levels right. If you're struggling to engage at the right level to get this moving, do reach out. We might be able to help you get the conversation conversation started in the right way. We've talked about governance. We've talked about process. So let's have a quick uh, deep dive into IT systems, particularly the security fabric, the IT tooling that protects you from external threats. And this is called defense in depth. So it's categorizing the different types of security tooling. Defense in depth is a principle that no single security measure is perfect and therefore multiple layers of security are needed to provide a comprehensive protection. Think of it like a defensive uh, defenses on a medieval castle with multiple barriers and the uh, which the attacker must overcome. But like any defenses, you're only as strong as your weakest point. And this is exactly what bad actors or hackers are trying to exploit. So if I take an example of a bunch of HR files sitting on a USB pen that's found on a bus, you know, this lack of removable drive uh, configuration was an issue in the device layer. Uh, and because of weaknesses here, identity was bypassed and data was accessed. So two common challenges we see are visibility into security and proactiveness. So talking about visibility, on average, it takes 270 days to recover from a major incident. 200 of those days are taken to find and discover the issue in the first place. And this could be intentional from the malware. They, they sit laying dormant, waiting for backup cycles to expire before they initiate. And without reporting, without tools to gain visibility, you're going blind. The second is proactiveness. So we know it costs 10 times the cost to recover than to prevent. You know, the Russian Iranian hackers we mentioned earlier, unfortunately, they don't work UK business hours. We asked, you know, no joy. Um, but we have the systems, the visibility and the service. Do we have the systems, the visibility and the services to protect our data when IT clocks off? So what are some tangible next steps to take away? Identify, understand whether you're in scope and whether you need to register before the deadline. Analyze, assess your current landscape, landscape and ensure that you're considering other frameworks and compliance you have to adhere to. Based on those findings, structure your risk versus cost versus complexity versus impact. Implement, you know, we've got a greatest hits of governance, um, the most effective ways to ensure that all this stuff gets embedded at the right levels. And review, start your continual improvement cycle or deploy this to different operating or strategic units or countries. So if you're struggling to know where to start, um, we wanted to provide an avenue um, to look at your governance and get you started on the NIST 2 um, uh, journey. You know, I'm keen for this really not to come across as a sales pitch. So for all those joining this session today, we wanted to provide a free assessment um, to analyze and review your Azure environment, to look at your security and best practice. This will hopefully, you know, as part of all of our assessments, we look at governance and this might be a really good segue into talking about NIST 2 in your business. So please reach out to us on LinkedIn uh, for myself, Liam or Craig, um, to, if you want to speak about that and, and engage in that. So thank you for your time. I'm going to bring in Craig and Liam, uh, and we're going to take look at the Q and A's and, and go through some questions. Hi guys. Hello. So Liam, Craig, welcome. Hey guys, morning, guys. Morning, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, are we coming through okay on the the camera? Yeah. Thank you. Cool. So um, I showed some stuff around uh, defense in depth, right? The different layers of security. Yeah. Um, you're out in the field, you're talking to customers about how you progress yeah. uh, secure, their security landscape or develop their security fabric. So, but Craig, what are you seeing? What are you speaking to customers about yeah. in terms of those different layers? Yeah, so, so the main conversation we're having with CISOs and, and senior execs is around visibility, which you can't touch on a second ago. It's that vast network, is that vast amount of frameworks around ISO and all things you can't touch on today in this too, um, the challenges around that. And then the tooling as well is a big is a big thing. Um, there's lots of legacy tooling out there. There's lots of duplication of tooling. So it, it's where we can can help with that is like you say we can go in and do assessments. We can analyze what they're using, what isn't working, what's out of date, and do a, I guess a real kind of good health check, a wrap around that, and that aligns and hopefully to help them with the yeah the frameworking and this too kind of stuff. But uh, mm. those are two the key things that come up quite regular and and uh, are definitely you know at the on in the board level and at the board table. So you've mentioned tooling there. So I mentioned um, visibility, um, a lack of tools 
are you seeing customers that have too many tools? Yes, on many, many occasions, people, uh, you know, over the years have kind of, you know, the new, the new shiny thing that's on the market, they buy it. Um, the duplication of you know antivirus, the duplication of, of, of firewall, there's lots of things out there. So a big thing, a big push now for CISO, they're looking to reduce cost and improve efficiency. Mm -hmm. So looking to how they can sweat the assets, now they can reduce their, their, you know, their state effectively, but still remain secure and still remain, um, you know, get some vulnerabilities and stuff, so they can still, you know, so operate. Striking that balance between exactly that. resources that they have yep. and the tooling available. Exactly that. Okay, nice. Liam, what are you what are you seeing and what are you speaking to customers about? Certainly more on the human layer is is a big topic at the moment. Because um, look, you can have all of the tools in the world. You can invest so much money, but actually all it takes is someone in admin to click on a link they shouldn't have done and the whole thing comes down. So certainly improving that security culture, the awareness, the education it is definitely in the field at the moment and certainly a big topic of conversation. Yeah. So what are things that, um, how can you empower users? Um, to be better at cyber security and protecting the business. Things like uh, regular security awareness training, making okay. sure they know what a threat looks like with simulated phishing as well. Okay. Um, you can do things like um, hold multiple different sessions and get, get your organisation in, um, theme it, and you can do training around different departments and make sure that it's specific to the people that you're actually talking to. Yeah, okay, great. So, okay. Yeah. I think we're coming up to time, guys. Thank you so much for joining. Um, if you enjoyed the session today, I would implore you to join the next one. Um, have a great day uh, and uh, hopefully speak to uh, you soon. Thanks for your time. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks for all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.